Number one, a wheel rotates three times per second in a counterclockwise direction. The center of the wheel does not move. What angle does the point rotate through in one second? So it said it rotates three times per second. So it's going to go around here one, two, three times. And each time around is two pi. So it's going to go two pi three times. So that's going to be a angle of six pi radians. Number two, a bike wheel is spinning in place. The vertical position of a point on the wheel in inches is described by this function. T is measured in seconds. What does the 13.5 mean in this context? So this is a bike wheel. So this amplitude here is going to be the radius of the bike wheel. So if we think of the bike wheel like this, and you've got the center of the wheel, and then you got all these spokes going out in the wheel, um, each of those spokes is going to be the 13.5. So it's the radius of that bike wheel. What is the meaning of the five in this context? So this five in here is the number of rotations per second. So the number of rotations per second. And then the 20, so the 20 is here outside of the function. And so that's going to be the starting height, um, which is going to be where the center of the wheel is. Number three, each expression describes the vertical position in feet off the ground of a carriage on a Ferris wheel after T minutes. Which function describes the largest Ferris wheel? So if we're talking the largest Ferris wheel, Ferris wheel is the biggest circle, right? Um, these first numbers here describe the radius of each wheel. So the largest number there would be the biggest wheel. So the largest number there is 250. So D would be the largest. These numbers at the end would tell you the height of the function. So if they're asking which one was highest off the ground, it would still be this one. Um, but those bottom number or those end numbers um, deal with the height, not how wide the wheel is. Number four, which trig function has a period of five? So remember the period deals with that um, inner number, okay? So inside of here. So this means it gets through one fifth of a rotation in two pi units. So one fifth of a rotation in two pi units means that the entire period would end up being two pi times five because it would need five of those to get through its whole rotation. So that period is going to be 10 pi. This one gets through five rotations in two pi. So each period in order to fit five of them into two pi, you would divide two pi by five. So this period is going to be two fifths pi. And we're looking for five. Um, so this one, okay, we're going to get five out of two pi into one rotation. And so then we can look at dividing this. So 2 pi divided by 5 over 2 pi. And when you divide fractions, remember you need to flip and multiply. So this is really going to be times um, 2 pi over 5. And that's going to give us not 5 because those are not going to cancel. So we're actually going to get 4 pi squared over 5. So definitely not that. So it must be D. Um, so let's look at dividing by 2 pi over 5. And again, that's going to be multiplying by the reciprocal or the flip of this fraction. So then we see that those 2 pi's cancel and we end up with a period of 5, which is what we were looking for. All right, number 5 says, what's the period of the function given by cosine of 4 pi um, t? So you can look at it as the number of rotations in a second, which is rewriting it as a number times 2 pi. 
So two pi being a rotation. Um, so then that'll cancel out your radians. So we get two rotations per second. And so that's in one second. So that means half a rotation um, in one second. The other thing you can do then is also look at um, doing it like I was doing on the other screen where we do the um, normal period of cosine, which is 2 pi divided by this number. So divided by 4 pi. So then the pi's cancel and you get 2 fourths, which equals 1 half. So that period is 1 half. And then it wants us to sketch a graph. Um, so this is telling us that we are going to get two rotations completed in one second, right? So two rotations of cosine in one second by looking at this idea. Um, and cosine starts at a maximum. So then we're going to get to a, we're going to get through the whole period in a, in half of a second. So halfway through that is at four eighths. And then we're going to be back to another rotation at two or sorry, at one second. So then halfway between um, each of these maxes will be at a min, right? So we get through the whole rotation. So then halfway between here will be at a min as well. So then we can start to see that we're going to get two full rotations in that one second. And then halfway between a min and a max, you're going to be at a zero or on that midline. So then halfway between these two, halfway between these two, halfway between these two. And then you can just kind of connect those. So that gets us through two full cycles um, in one second. So we've got this first cycle. I'll just color this one orange. So there's one cycle in half a second and then a second cycle in one second. Number six, um, here is the graph of cosine of x sketch a graph of cosine of 2x. So remember, this means we need to get through two periods, or sorry, two rotations in the normal period. So we need to get two, um, two cycles, I'll call it. So two cycles in the normal amount of time. So this is going to squish these together. So instead of getting through this one cycle in 2 pi, now we need to get through this cycle um, in just pi units in half the time. So over here, so we're still at a max at one, but now instead of being at a max at two pi, it's going to push into pi. So then halfway between that will be at this minimum. And then it'll repeat that. So in another pi units will be at a max and halfway between that will be at a min. So we get two rotations in and what would have been the normal time period for our original graph. So then we just get double the time. So then same thing over here. So it's going to squish in. So instead of at negative 2 pi having a max, that'll squish into negative pi. So in half the amount of time. Then between those two, we'll be at a minimum. And then again, another pi units, it'll get through another cycle. So halfway through that, it'll be at a min and then back up to its max. So it gets through double the amount that it would have in the original. Um, and then so how do they compare? So same amplitude. So they're going, you know, the high and lows are still at one and negative one. Um, same midline. So that midline is still there at zero. Okay, so we got one and negative one. We still got a midline at zero. Um, but they've got different periods. So the period here, it got through one cycle in 2 pi. The period of this one, it got through one cycle in pi units. All right, so when we're looking at um, number seven, it says here's a table that shows the values of F, G, and H for some values of X. Use the table to determine the A value in this. So we're looking for where um, the G function and the F function are the same, and then trying to compare what we need to do for those X values. So we're going to look at their outputs. So we're looking at some values of F and G 
where the outputs are the same. Now, obviously at zero, they're the same. So that's not gonna do us any good because we don't know what number we're multiplying because zero times anything is zero. So we see um, these values are the same for three and for nine. Okay, we also see um, that these values are the same, one and one, and that's at six and 18. And so we wanna kind of compare what is happening to make those values the same. So um, when we do this, we can look at, so F of, um, or sorry, G of nine. So if we look at G of nine, because that's this one. So G of nine equals F of three, right? So the output at nine for the G function is equal to the output at the F function. So now we want to figure out how do these numbers compare through multiplication. So we want to rewrite this as um, F of what number times nine? So that that X is the same. So what number times nine will basically give us three? So this is going to be one third of nine. So that's telling us that G of X is equal to F of one third of that X value. So you could look at that and see if that works. So G of 18, so if we looked at that 18, this is saying that G of 18 would equal F of one third of 18. And what's one third of 18? One third of 18 is six, whoops. So then look at F of six and see if that was the same one. And it was G of 18 equals F of six. So A is one third in this case. Then in part B, it says use the same table to come up with um, what it would be that connects H to F. So now we're looking for um, numbers that are the same in H and F. So outputs in H and F that are the same. So again, I see this one. Okay, I also see 64. So if I write this out, I've got H of X, um, and let's write in a number there. So H of 12, right? So H of 12 equals F of, so that was the one, so equals F of six. So now we want to rewrite this as F of what number times 12? So what number times 12 will get me to six? And that's half. So half of 12. And so then let's look at the other one. So the other one was 18 and nine. So is nine half of 18? Yes. So H of X is equal to F of one half of whatever X is.